pushing back when the darkest weapons fall. There's a power on my lips that even death can't defy. When the name of our God is lifted high, because there is resurrection power when we sing. My 
Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance seen by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing. that you guys are here with us this morning, um, whether you're joining us online or in person. Um, I am excited to sing these next couple of songs with you. Um, we're going to keep talking every week about um, Advent, about love and hope and peace um, and, and joy. And um, this week I was, um, you know, just reminded through several different friends, several different people that I know, um, that right now we're all carrying a lot, um, a lot. And, and I, um, I love the verse where it says to, um, bring all of your burdens before the Lord and he will give you rest. And so I want to invite you, um, whatever is going on in your heart and in your mind, in your life right now, um, bring that before the Lord. Um, and I have this thing in my own life. That's something I'm constantly dealing with. That I like to bring God things and then I like to sneak back and take them back. <laughs> and it, it's, a, it's a lack of trust. It's a thing that I'm learning um, every single day is that I can trust God. 
Um, he has been faithful. He has come through for me every single time. And I don't need to walk back and pick up the things that I'm, I'm laying down before him. I don't, I don't need to take those burdens. He will give me the rest that I need. Um, and he will, he will just continue to build that trust with me as I lay down the things that are burdening me. And so whatever is on your heart this morning, however you're feeling, if you're feeling worried, if you're feeling a lack of peace, if you're feeling hopeless, if you're feeling like flat, there's no joy, um, bring that before the Lord as we sing these next couple songs and, and set it down and lay it down and walk away um, and just sing these songs with your whole heart as an offering to the Lord to remind you. Um, more importantly, we're singing to God, but we're also reminding ourselves as we sing who he is, what he has done, and, and how amazing a God we serve. from hell.
to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died
Father God, we, we love you. We, we give you this morning our, our praise and our adoration. God, you're deserving of everything that we can give you. And my, I pray, God, that this morning as we, as we interact with your word, that our hearts are, are changed, God. That something that is said this morning, that something that we've sung, something changes us, God. Um, I, I pray that as we just continue to talk about um, these, these parts of Advent, this, these concepts of love and joy and peace and hope, God, that you are filling us with those things during these weeks, God. And then I pray that you're constantly reminding us the story of your birth, God, and, and why that's so important. Um, God, that you're, you're helping us to, to look forward to your birth, to look forward to the death and the resurrection, God, because that's where our salvation lies. God, we love you so much, and we just praise you this morning. And God, I, I want to lift up um, Pastor Zach as he's coming up here, um, probably distracted <laughs> by his beautiful wife. Um, God, we, we just want to lift up Alyssa to you. We want to um, pray, God, that, that you give Zach the words this morning. Um, that, that you have for him to, to, to deliver to us. Um, God, and we pray for Alyssa. She's at home um, hoping to have this baby. God, we just pray that um, you would ease her pain. Um, you would mainly just ease the worry that they have. Um, God, we trust you with uh, this little baby's life. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, North Hills Church. My name is Zach Schiffer, lead pastor here at North Hills Church, and I'm so glad you joined us this morning for our worship service. Uh, this morning, we're continuing on through our Advent series that we're calling The Gift Exchange, where we are looking at what does Jesus want for Christmas? So if you'll join me in prayer, we're going to um, open with a word of prayer, and then we'll go to our Bibles and start this week's message. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for our opportunity to hear from you through your word this morning. Father, we pray that you would meet us in this place, that you would speak to our hearts, and that we would come away from here changed, that we would be changed in a way where we have grown closer to you, and that we know more about who you are and how much you love us, God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Well, like I said, we are going to continue on through our Advent series this week, and this week is the week where we explore joy. This is commonly called Godet Sunday, and um, the the pink candle of your Advent set, uh, se- Advent wreath. There it is. The, the pink candle of your Advent wreath symbolizes joy, and so we're going to be looking at joy this morning. But like we have done for every week of this series, we want to look at what is on Jesus' Christmas list. And what I can tell you, jumping right to the point, is what's on his list is a relationship with you and with me. That he came to earth at Christmas so that he could rejoin God and man. He could remove the distance, the broken relationship there and restore a healthy, loving relationship between God and man. And so what he wants this Christmas, what Jesus wants this Christmas is a relationship with you and I. And when we come into that relationship with Jesus, sometimes we're not feeling joy. When we come into Christmas time, sometimes there's some of us who are just, we're just not experiencing joy. Instead, for many of us, Christmas time has this, has this way of reminding us of our loss and our grief, of the, of the hopes and dreams that were maybe were lost this past year. And, and so we don't experience joy at Christmas. Instead, we, we are reminded of the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or something. Sometimes it can really hurt at Christmas. And grief is a reality for all of us. It's, it's part of life on this planet. But today, I want to encourage you to let go of your grief, not to hold on to grief, to give your grief away, to give it to Jesus because he wants a relationship with you. Because he wants a relationship with you and I this Christmas. He's willing 
to take on our grief, to experience our grief, to experience our hurt with us so that we can experience him and we can experience joy through him. So I want to start today by looking at our grief. We're going to start there before we get to joy. We're going to start and look at what we can learn from scripture about our loss. And then we will get to joy. Then we'll, then we'll get to looking at how we experience joy. And so the first thing I want us to think about this morning is that when we are experiencing grief, deep, painful loss in our lives, our plan often is not the best plan. The, the typical plan of, of human beings is isolation. First, we tend to deny our loss, where we, we, it results in anger because we just keep trying to somehow deny that that loss actually happened. And then we try to delay our pain, where we, we walk around in denial for a while, and it leads us uh, us to being kind of fake in all of our other relationships around us. And lastly, we, we try to distract ourselves. We try to numb the pain so that we can forget it. All of these coping mechanisms that we use instead of going to Jesus, instead of giving our pain away, all of these coping mechanisms result in isolation and most of them lead us to addictions that aren't healthy for us and that pain doesn't go away, it just gets carried along with us through our life. And so let's talk about how we can let go of pain so God can replace it with something better. That's why we have Christmas is because Jesus came to bring joy, to replace our pain with something better at Christmas time. But before we can get there, we know we need to be comforted. You might be feel, hearing me say all of this, and it might almost make you angry to hear it because you might be saying, I I'm hurting so much right now that it offends me that you would even say this to me. So hear me now. I come before you humbly to tell you these things to encourage you that God comforts us now by reminding us that he has walked through grief and he walks with us. I want to turn to Psalm chapter 30. We're going to re read this whole psalm. This is, this is written by David, a man who experienced a lot of loss, a lot of grief in his life. He lost a best friend in Jonathan. He lost a mentor, Samuel, passed away. He lost the, the affection and the love of his, his wife, Michal. He lost a baby. His, he had a baby, a son, with Bathsheba who passed away and died. He lost a relationship with an employer, Saul, who tried to kill him, right? We can relate to these situations. We can relate to this loss. And God's people have been experiencing it. And this is what one of them says in Psalm chapter 30. This is what David says. He says, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it, procl will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. That my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. To someone who had experienced a lot of loss, a lot of hurt, 
a lot of betrayal in his life. David writes this as a, as a poem to encourage others who are hurting. He, when he says, sing the praises of the Lord, you, you his faithful people, that tells us that he's writing this to somebody to encourage them in the midst of their hurt and their pain that they can experience joy through Jesus. First, let's look at verse 11 again. He says, you turned my wailing, our deep hurt, our, our cries because of our loss. You turned my wailing into dancing. There's an exchange there. He says, you re- removed my sackcloth, which was a way of showing your mourning in their culture. He says, you removed that. You took that away from me and you clothed me with joy. There's an exchange there. He says, he clothed them with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. The God, God has a purpose. It's not just a nice to have. It's not just some, some afterthought, but God actually has a purpose for giving you joy through experience with him. And that purpose is that you can live life and live life fully and that you can praise God and sing of his praises. And so there's a purpose in your pain, a purpose that is probably driving you back to God so that you can walk with him, so you can experience life to the full, so that you can sing his praises forever. The exchange here is grief for joy. But Zach, you don't know what I've been through this year. You don't know how deeply this hurts. You don't know that I lost a child this year. Zach, you don't, you don't know how much it hurts because this loved one of mine died or because I didn't get that promotion and that was my dream. God knows. God knows what you're feeling. I have my own grief and I'm gonna share that with you guys later in this message, but God knows. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53, verse three. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. This is a prophecy about Jesus. We celebrate Christmas time because God came to be with us, came to walk this earth, came to experience what we experience. God knows. God has experienced pain like you feel. He was despised by a great number of people. He was rejected by mankind. To this day, people still reject Jesus. They still, they still uh, uh, hate Jesus for their own various reasons. It says that Jesus was a man of suffering and he was familiar with pain. He was tortured to the point of death. He's familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. When Jesus went to the cross, God himself turned away. Jesus, who had experienced perfect relationship and community with God from before time began was separated from God because of the shame and the guilt and our sin heaped upon him. And he was despised. It says, and we held him in low esteem. People don't no longer hold Jesus with much esteem. There's many people out there who disrespect Jesus daily. So whatever you're hurting with, Whatever you're feeling today, Jesus knows. God knows. He's felt that hurt. And he's asking, not for you to go alone feeling that hurt, not for you to be alone, not for you to isolate. He's saying, let me be there with you. Let me experience that pain. God's plan for our grief is for us to share it with him, for us to gift it to him this Christmas. And this is how we do that. First, we have to acknowledge the reality of our pain, that it's there, that it's real, that it hurts, 
just a couple of weeks ago, I lost my grandfather uh, to COVID. He, he contracted uh, the coronavirus and he passed away. His lungs filled up with fluid and he suffocated to death because of corona. And it hurts a little bit right here for me to say that here today. But I'm acknowledging the reality that, that grandpa, grandpa passed. This is a man who I had probably more respect for than any person I've ever met. He loved his family well. He provided for his family well. He loved Jesus. He spent every morning in this chair next to this glass looking out uh, over his backyard from the second story and he would sp- he spend it pouring through the Bible, praying to God for each one of his grandkids. He loved Jesus. He, he, was, he worked in construction. He, he was uh, a member of the army. He grew up on a farm and wherever it landed him, wherever life took him, he was walking with Jesus. I had so much respect for him. He was a mentor of mine. He was a loved one of mine. And he's passed away. I can't go fly to Chicago and say hello. I can't go fishing with him anymore. He's passed away. And missing him hurts. We have to acknowledge the reality of our pain. Second, we have to tell God about our pain and our loss. Part of my, my grieving process of grandpa was that uh, a day or two after he passed away, um, I, I almost experienced uh, a, 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 an anxiety attack. I had like sharp chest pains, difficulty breathing, um, I couldn't think straight, uh, and it just snuck up on me. I wasn't addressing my grief even during that short amount of time uh, uh, prior to that in, in a way that could keep me healthy and could keep me moving. And in some ways, I was uh, trying to distract myself uh, by, by staying busy with work and with family and stuff like that. I was kind of almost in denial a little bit, like that it wasn't, it wasn't really real yet. It didn't feel real. And that day, I just laid on the bed. I took, I took a whole day off. I had, I had meetings planned and stuff for the church. I, I, I canceled everything. I pushed it all back. I laid on the bed, and I just poured out my heart about this is the way it hurts. This is why he meant so much to me. This is why it's a loss that I won't be able to call him up and talk to him. Grandpa was somebody I fell back on during tough times. He was someone who always had a word of wisdom, encouragement. He knew just the right scripture to point me to. And I had to tell God that I was going to miss that in my life. It felt like part of my foundation had, had crumbled and fallen away. I, I had this mental image of me standing almost on two pillars with my weight distributed evenly across those two. And for as grandpa passed, that, 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 one, that one pillar crumbled. And now I felt like I was just out, lost in the wind, balancing on, on one pillar. And as I poured out to God about this pain and this loss, he, he opened my eyes to see that that one foot that I thought was on just a narrow ledge, just a, just a pillar, was the foundation of all the other relationships God had given me in life. It was the foundation of the faith I had. It was the foundation of the church I'm a part of that I could step over and be supported, that God had provided for me. And it, and it lessened the blow. And la- the third thing we do to, to, in, to give our grief to God is that we wait to hear from him about his comfort. This can come in the form of scripture. As, as I spent that day in, in the bedroom by myself, I was pouring through the Bible, I would, I would stop reading, I would pray, I'd lay back on the bed and pour out my heart to God, return back to scripture, and so sometimes he speaks to us through scripture, and sometimes he speaks to us through others, where I, where I confess my hurt now, not just to God, but to others, so that they too can encourage me, they can give me scripture, etc. So as I left that bedroom and I started walking through my life, and I started confessing, telling the story just like I am to you today, 
others were able to encourage me. I had so much more of a foundation than I ever realized because others could encourage me, others could share scripture with me, and I could hear from God how I was to proceed and move forward. I could see how he was providing for me. I was still going to miss Grandpa. I still am missing Grandpa. It's still sad that he, that he died because of sin in this world, and sin leads to death. But I could see a future. I could see a way forward. We're going to come back to that story in a minute. But I want you to, I want you to remember that God comforts us. He comforts us right now by just being with us. Now, now next, he comforts us later. He comforts us in the future by removing every reason for grieving for all of eternity. Turn with me to Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 22. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought of as a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and they will dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. What can we learn from this? God gives us a future. He comforts us because he reminds us of the future we have. This, this passage, the, when I was preparing this message and I read this, reminded me of so many hurts that God is going to make right. So many hurts that will no longer be, be a burden because his kingdom, his future with, as we dwell with him looks different than the hurt that you feel trapped in today, than your experience for today. It, this passage speaks to those who have, who have lost a child. It says, never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. This passage speaks to those who have lost a loved one due to sickness or old age. It says, an old man who does not live out his, never again will there be an old man who does not live out his years. This passage speaks to those who have tried to create a home, a household, a family, but not got to enjoy it. And they lost maybe that dream. So if you've had a dream that you lost, this passage is speaking to you. Alyssa and I felt hurt in our marriage because in the early years of our marriage, we'd buy a house and we'd kind of fix it up and pour our blood, sweat, and tears into it in our heart. And then following God, we'd end up moving pretty quickly onto the next one. And then again, we'd, we'd, Alyssa would, is great at interior design. She would make the place beautiful. I would put all this labor into, into working and fixing it up. And then it just felt to us like we were just handing it off to somebody else. That we never got to enjoy the work of our hands, the hope of living in this beautiful spot. We were just handing it off. And every time we moved, it seemed like real estate got more and more expensive. And these hopes of having a home that we could just, just relax and enjoy our family in just seemed to evaporate. And it hurt. It grieved us. We had to mourn that. But he says that that's not the future. That's not God's plan for the new heaven and the new earth. And so he comforts us in the future. He comforts us in the now, we talked about, but he also comforts us in the future, in the new heaven and the new earth. He says that his chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. That sounds a whole lot like the garden, 
or after a long, good week of work, we sit down and we look back at it and God's sitting, I kind of imagine, in a rocking chair right next to us and we look out over what we've done, the work of our hands, and say, it is good. And we experience joy. We enjoy it, the work of our hands. My third point is that God gives joy in the journey. The time between right now where he's comforting us in our pain and in our grief and the time when there's a new heaven and a new earth where he's going to comfort us for eternity, he gives us joy in the journey. We've experienced, we're going to experience his comfort, but he also gives us joy for the journey, the in-between. See, we live in this tension as, as Christ followers of knowing we've been saved we, we've experienced the beginning of our relationship with Christ and now we're following him, but there's still difficulty in this world. There's still hurt. There's still sin. There's still death in this world. So there will still be loss before we get to heaven, before we get to the new heavens and the new earth, before we get to dwell with the Lord for eternity. And so he gives us joy for the journey. And that brings us to Christmas, where an angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. That's why we light these candles at Christmas, to remind us of joy, to remind us to seek after a relationship with Christ, to experience joy. And so our first week of this series, we talked about uh, exchanging our despair for hope, and we, and we lit one of these candles. In our second week of the series, we talked about exchanging our worry for peace, and we lit another candle. And this week, we're talking about exchanging our grief for joy. And so if you're following along, if you have an Advent wreath at home, light the pink candle with me. And let's talk about joy. What is joy? A lot of these concepts are often hard for us to put our finger on because language is fluid and the way we use it can change over time. And so what is joy? Well, it equates a lot with our word happiness in English. It's, it's, it's good feelings. It's, it's, it's a leap of our heart. It's often something that makes us you know, stand up and cheer like, it, like at a sporting event when, when you watch, a, watch your team make a touchdown. It, it causes us to move. And as I was studying all the words, all the ways joy was used throughout Scripture, it, it mirrored that, that happiness, that joy, that excitement that happened, usually because of a circumstance, usually because something happened or someone you loved appeared. And it would cause you to move inside, a flutter of the heart, a twinkle of the eye, a turn where, you, where your, your emotions moved it, from, from maybe despair into happiness. It's, it's almost always a movement. It's an experience. We're talking about experiencing Christ this Christmas and that we can experience his hope his peace, his joy. But so much of what we run after in life, is happiness, joy, is fleeting, right? There's a lot of talk about happiness today in our world, and we say things about other people like, I just want them to be happy, right? Or you deserve happiness, which I think is a lie, because we the Bible says that because of our sinful nature, we, we deserve some pretty negative things. We deserve death. But, but God wants to give us joy. He wants to give us happiness His way, an eternal way, a way that, that doesn't pass away. The way that we seek after happiness often can lead us into some bad places or our, our never-ending hunger for happiness can leave us very hurt. Think about this. Where do you go for joy? 
Some of us watch sports, like I mentioned. We watch football players run out of the tunnel and they're jumping up and down and they're so excited for this game. Some of us seek joy through romance, where if, if I can see that person again, your heart, your heart takes wings, it grows wings. Your heart, your, your stomach feels like you have butterflies inside of it. You, you can't describe the feeling. That's a taste of joy. Some of us seek beauty. I used to guide backpacking trips and things in the Grand Canyon. And I, a couple times, had people actually close their eyes, put a hand on somebody's shoulder, and I led them to the edge of the canyon, arranged them along the edge. There was a, there was a stone wall. They're not going to fall over. Don't worry. Uh, I wasn't ir- being irresponsible. Then I would, you know, kind of position them, all line them up, and I would ask them to open their eyes. And often there would be tears, not tears of sadness, because of the beauty they saw before them of God's creation. There were tears of joy as we stood in awe of what God had done. I hope to experience this soon in the birth of my, my third son, where we see this life in front of us, this creation of God, this beauty, and we experience joy. But all of those, all of those are fleeting. They're moments. They're moments so easily lost that, that our whole culture is built around pursuing more, more happiness, more joy. Pursue, pursue, pursue. But we're pursuing not the source, but some of the elements of joy. The Bible says that Jesus is the source. All of those other elements are temporary things, right? Think about it. Romance. Even if you have a beautiful, amazing, wonderful relationship, it has to end, right? At some point, Alyssa and I are going to pass away, and one of us will lose the other, and there will be hurt. Hurt because of the love we experienced. Hurt because of the joy. That's a beautiful thing, but there's still that hurt, still that grief, still that loss involved. With my boys, they bring me so much joy at moments, but then at other times, they can bring me some grief. They might make decisions as, as, as teenagers, as young men someday, that caused me a lot of grief. There might be a break in the relationship. I'm going to pursue them. I've committed to them, vowed to them to pursue them as their father and love them well. But there might be a break in the relationship that causes us grief because there's loss, right? Those football players who came running out of the tunnel jumping for joy, it's perplexing. They're about to go face a grand foe Maybe, you know, if it's the Super Bowl, the greatest competition of their day, they might lose and lose the dream of winning that game. And there might be, there might be a feeling of, of loss, of grief. Beauty is fleeting. There can be, there can be this loss. If we want to experience joy, we have to experience Jesus because Jesus is not temporary. Jesus is not going to lead to heartache and loss. We need joy that lasts, joy that sustains us, joy that that creates in us a new person every day, just like the psalmist talked about. Joy comes in the morning. It's just around the corner, and we need more of it. And so we have to look to the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. We have to look to the one who is eternal, who is faithful, who keeps his promises. And so let's look at one of those promises. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 35 so that we can experience joy for the journey. Let's look at his promise. Isaiah chapter 35. Okay, we're going to, we're going to read this, this chapter. It's a short chapter here. But a little background. Exile is coming. God's people have rebelled against him. They've forgotten God. They're chasing foreign idols. And exile is coming. And and the writer, the prophet Isaiah, is trying to give them hope for the future loss and grief they're going to experience by promising them joy for the future. By promising them joy that that can maybe carry them through 
He's trying to point them back to God so that they'll experience God and experience joy. And this is what he says. Chapter 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about it, about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. Joy is coming. This is a promise of joy a promise we can experience. It's saying, if you walk with God, joy is promised. Verses one through seven is a pretty pretty awesome promise because to the people that this was promised to, there was so much meaning here. These are the Israelites. Their story is that they were slaves in Egypt, brought out of Egypt by God's mighty hand, and then they had to wander in the desert for a while because of their sin, and, and that, was, that was like the worst thing, right? That was like the, that was the groaning, that was the grief. But God rescued them from that and he gave them a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where they could raise their children, where they could experience joy in God's presence. But then they turned their back on God. And so the, the, the desert was going to be their story again for a while because of their sin. They were, they were taken off into um, uh, uh, exile, taken from their land and, and moved to another land, and they were exiled from their land, and in, that, in the process, they had to journey across a great desert, the, the, the Sinai Peninsula, and so th- this was obvious to them that something's wrong, that this is a curse, that this is punishment, that this is discipline by God to turn them from their evil ways and turn them back to God but they were promised hope. That that place that they dreaded so much, that desert would rejoice. That the wilderness meant a place where you couldn't grow crops, but it would, that it would blossom. That the crocus is a flower and it will burst into bloom. That those who are hurting, that those who are old, that those who are feeble will be restored and redeemed. He's going to make all things new. This is a promise of joy. All those things are ways we will experience joy. And so, we're not blind, but do you, do you see the joy here in this passage? We're not blind like the person in this passage, but do you look around to experience God's joy every day? Do you know him? This promise is for people who know him. This promise is for people who want to experience God every, jo- every day and experience him in joy. Verse five is talking about, then, the eye, then will the eyes of the blind be opened. I want to see God. I want to hear what he is doing. I want to experience his joy. I want to experience him this Christmas. This passage reveals to us that it's a journey to joy. There's, there's imagery of like a highway 
that, that we will walk, a, a path that we will follow God in, that he's gonna lead us back to the place he's prepared for us. It says in verse eight, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. It will be for those, this joy, for those who walk on the way of holiness, in the way of holiness. It says the unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. Fools are somebody who are not careful, somebody who's not paying attention. It might not, they might be very smart, but they're not, they're not prudent, they're not faithful. Joy is a journey. Experiencing Christ is a journey. As Christ followers, the baby who we celebrate at Christmas grew up to be a man. He was God with us, and he grew up to be a man, and he called out to people and said, come follow me. And those people had the opportunity to follow Jesus, just as you and I today have the opportunity to experience him and follow him. And as we follow him, he is our influence. He changes who we are, and he gives us these gifts. And so in scripture, there are the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of following him, and one of them is joy. One of them that we can experience is an ongoing joy in knowing him. And it is better to give than to receive. We say this around Christmas. I want to challenge you guys to think about it this Christmas. It is better to give away our grief. It's better to give of, of our plans, to give of our hopes. We're giving it all to Jesus because he can give us joy. Because he can give us everything we ever dreamed in experiencing him. That's what we were made for, was to experience him. Along the way, along the way, along this path, it's a, it's a dangerous path. It's a path through a wilderness, but it's the safest place to be in the midst of his will. My grandfather, who passed away, when I think of him, even though at times there's pain, there's also that twinkle of joy. Because I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he's standing with Jesus right now. And that brings me joy to know that I will walk with him again, that I will see him again, that I'll experience him again, just, just as we were before, but better. Because grandpa won't have a heart condition again. Being in, on, on the path with God, being a Christ follower, is the safest place to be. Because when all of the hurts of this world, even death, come upon us, we, can't, we can never lose our joy in Christ. My grandfather, before he passed, he was barely coherent anymore. But in the last hours, he started sticking out his hand and waving. And he had this wave. He had, he had really thick hands from milking cows and working construction. And he had this wave where he would just twist his hand like this. And my dad was telling me, because my dad was with him in the last hours, that he, that he started to wave. Well, he never waved like that goodbye. I vividly remember this wave because every time I saw him, he would wave like that. He would smile. There'd be a twinkle in his eye, and he would wave just like that to greet you. He was greeting Jesus that night. He was greeting Jesus with a wave to take him home to his eternal home where I will join him once again. I have joy in knowing that Grandpa is there. I have joy in walking through this life with Christ, knowing that, he, that Christ loves me and I love him in return, and that joy can never be taken from me by any grief, by any loss, by anything that happens circumstantially. That joy can never be taken from me. And so I want to remind you this Christmas that if we're holding on to grief and loss, if our hands are full of that, we can never accept and receive this gift 
of joy. Last scripture, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Pray with me. Father God, this Christmas we want to experience you. We want to experience your joy, a joy that can never be taken away from us, a joy that is renewed every day. We know that that joy comes from knowing you, comes from experiencing you, experiencing your son Jesus. Father, we pray for that kind of joy in our lives. Father, we give you our grief and our loss and our hurt. We give you all of who we are. We confess these things to you today. And we pray that your joy would come upon us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning and uh, joining us for this message. Uh, I, I just, my prayer for you this week is that uh, we could wrestle through our grief and our loss and that we could give it to God. Please confess those things to him. Please find somebody that you can confess your hurt to so that he can carry us through our present, so that he can comfort us in our future and that he can give us joy for the journey. You guys have a great week. I love you.